Okay, babe, do it again. Oh my gosh, so we're getting married in T minus like 25 minutes. Ketuba is actually the official marriage, babe. And so is the wedding <laughs> certificate signing. So actually you're married before you go in for the ceremony, to be very honest. Okay. This watch is my grandfather's who passed away. And my grandmother gave it to me a really long time ago and I've only worn it for like huge events. She saved up tons of money to buy it for him. Bend over a little bit. Not the last time you're gonna tell me that. It will not be the last time I tell you that. There you go. Doesn't look too loose? No, you're fine. Okay. Okay. So my little fuckers um, on. Hey, I just met you. Do I look like a server? Kind of. I'm kidding. Oh, take your shoes out of the India bag. Okay. Go quick. Babe, we have to go. Quick. It's 5.02. It's 5.02? Yes. I had been in China doing research and studying in the fall of uh, 2008. I remember coming back to New York and like sort of having it in my mind, like, oh, you know, I'd like to meet someone. And my good friend Sarah, right when I got back to New York, it was her birthday, like, come down to Q Bar, East Village, celebrate my birthday with me. I, I sort of looked up and I, Paul was like standing across from me in the bar. I thought, oh, like, he's attractive. I was there with like a bunch of friends, so I wasn't really paying attention to like guys. And it wasn't a gay bar, so it wasn't like, like radar was not turned on by any means. Then that same friend Sarah was like, look, I want to get people together. I've been out of the country for six months. And Leslie and Sarah lived out in Brooklyn and had this amazing backyard and this huge apartment, so they were going to throw a party. I didn't realize at the time, but the party was being thrown because Mitch had just moved back from China and was, wanted to like see all of his new school friends and all that stuff. We rolled up to the apartment and we walk in and I did remember like meeting Mitch very briefly at the bar and so I was like, oh, hey, it's good to see you again. And then like doorbell rings and open the door and there's Paul. Mitch and I have not been apart since. I am Janae, and I met Mitchell um, when we were 11 years old. My family moved to Fort Smith, Arkansas. We just became best friends. The community that we lived in um, was within the church community. I mean, that's really what we did everything in. We went to church every single Sunday, like did not meet, like miss church for any reason at all. We ate dinner at the table every single night as a family, just very conservative. Living in a more kind of conservative Christian environment, you don't talk about homosexuality very openly. When you do, it's not in a positive light. I mean, the unfortunate thing I think about growing up in a place like Fort Smith where people aren't as open, people don't even have the language to talk about it. The things that we were taught, like in church, I can remember Mitch and I having conversations like, is that really true? Like, do you really feel that way? Because I know that's what they're telling us, but I don't, like, I don't really feel that way. Constantly worrying if someone, you know, if, if they, the like sort of abstract they, whoever that is, finds out, I'm done for. For anyone who is, it was in his position, I mean, why would you choose to stay somewhere like that? Even my extended relatives, you know, it's like I couldn't, everywhere I turned, like from school to church to home, I was bounded by that. But it was after being away that I sort of became more comfortable with coming out. Like he grew up in such a different world than I did. Well, Paul has been the uh, absolute happiness of our life. Growing up, going to summer camp and high school, it was totally fine to be whoever you were. You know, when we were growing up, we were like, had these values instilled in us about being accepting and, you know, looking at everybody as equal. We thought a lot about how we could have kids feel good about 
exploring their Jewish identities and we realized that that was about them being together. So we mostly made safe spaces for people to be. As soon as it was clear that Paul was gay, there was no question that from a young age it was just like, of course he should be able to date anybody he wants and he should get married and he should have all the same things that we have. I think he realized that everybody would still love him, be friends with him. No one was going to give him a hard time. Lots of times parents get so obsessed with it that they have to confront them. And I think they're gonna tell you when they're ready and you don't have to confront. And he didn't have to tell me. And one day at work, I was sitting with him and I said, you know what, wherever your life takes you, we're supportive of you because of who you are and what you are. It is hard for me at times when people are like, you know, it's really hard for me to come out and I'm like, but you just have to do it. Like, I can't even speak from the same era because I did not grow up in that universe. Can you guys come to the edge of the shadow line? I think they really complement each other. When we came to New York to visit, Paul just like would clean up that kitchen. Like after we ate, it would just be instant. Mitchell is not like that. Maybe he is now, but he has never been like that since I've known him. <laughs> Our personalities are completely opposite of each other. I'm a huge extrovert. I go out, I love being with friends, I love talking a ton. On a weekend, the last thing I ever want to do is take a nap in the middle of the day. Mitch is completely the opposite. He needs to be kind of pushed into social things and once he's in them, he loves them, but like you have to talk him into everything that you do. I like to sleep in, and Paul's like, you're wasting the day. Paul is the type of person that wants to get into things fast and quick, and Mitch is more subdued, more laid back, which is good. But Mitchell's also this big dreamer, this big thinker, and I think, you know, he will come up with these grand ideas that they will probably do, but Paul will actually execute. He was one that convinced me to go back and finish my master's in education as opposed to staying in business-based design that I was doing before, and I am so thankful for that. And he's the one that's pushed me to do a lot of things that I was kind of apprehensive about before. For so many reasons, I look up to him or I look to him for guidance or watch the way he responds and try to like mimic that in my own life because I have a tremendous amount of respect for not just his values but the way in which he puts them into action. He put it to me best, he's like, I know you're really pissed off with me when you don't say anything and you're extremely quiet because I never shut up usually. you just down the list, like I'll say something and he's like, oh no, it's the, I was like the exact opposite. So because they are so different, like I couldn't imagine a better fit for Mitch. I remember when I first kind of come out to myself, I remember being really upset because in my mind, the idea of like getting married, having a family, I remember being like, okay, this can't happen now. You're going to weddings like all the time. It's like you're put in this situation and forced to observe like someone else going through this really, you know, important ritual and knowing full well that like, okay, well, you know, that's not gonna be available to me. Where's the chills? Sure. I didn't have a lot of connection to the gay rights movement. I found it to be more damaging than anything else. And I also, I think it was very cynical. I did not really think that marriage, while I thought it was gonna happen in our lifetime, the ability to marry, I didn't really think it was gonna happen in the foreseeable future. It looks great. It, looks great. it never really attached to like going and making political change for a lot of years until I actually started going to Albany and like lobbying legislature. I had the pleasure and the honor of being the executive director of the Empire State Pride Agenda, which is New York's gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender civil rights organization. Paul came in and volunteered uh, through our Offsprung Committee, which was the next generation of LGBT leadership, and that's what Offsprung was conceived and inspired to be. Paul came in and he was a rock star. He, together with his co-chair, created some really magnificent programming uh, that was really important in talking to the younger generation and young professionals where, where they were. Bring them in and then get them engaged. 
LGBT organizations can take really important work and we make it so non-sexy that nobody wants to be a part of it. And I'd like to say that Paul and a few others brought the sexy back to work. He really forged the path when it came to bringing in young professionals into this fight and talking to a generation that hadn't been ad as engaged in their own advocacy and activism around uh, issues important to our community. I have to say it was his like incredible enthusiasm for equality and justice and his ability to take people who were otherwise complacent and to make them you know, extraordinarily passionate about their own lives and about their own equality. And I think Paul just lives that. And I was like, I actually like, my own small personal experience is going to have sway. And this isn't just like organizing parties to raise funds for a gay rights organization. This actually is going to mean something. He helped bring a bunch of folks um, to Albany to talk to their legislators. And shortly thereafter, we certainly saw Paul's like enthusiasm and drive. He was so good that he actually became the first uh, member of Offsprung to be moved into the board. Even if he didn't do all the work that he does politically and all, um, I certainly believe that he would be a role model for anybody. It's just incredible to see that the world has changed around him enough while he helps changing the world. It was kind of amazing to me that like at that time I saw there was thousands of people in Albany for us and there was tons of supporters and this could very well happen. Seeing that when I did talk to somebody, they did listen and they wanted to make a difference, if only for my vote, but at least for my vote. And they knew that we were a force to be reckoned with. We decided to get married before New York State even had marriage. We had kind of decided it. We knew it was going to happen within the next year, two, three years. It was going to happen at some point in the foreseeable future. I remember we walking back from a movie. And we just that's what we talked about. I was like, okay, let's like, what does it mean to you? Around the time that conversation started, I got accepted to go to MIT. As Mitch does international urban development and urban planning. And for us to live in other countries or to be able to get grants to go places and visas and all that stuff, you have to be an established couple. Basically, both of us sort of said, it's like a contract. You're formalizing a relationship by making certain commitments to each other. And we decided we needed to tell our families. And we were going to tell my family because my parents, my grandparents, my sister and husband, everybody was coming in. That whole week leading up to them getting all these calls with Pride Agenda, and all this stuff is happening behind closed door discussions and marriage is gonna to go to the floor. We were staying in our living room, I think like most people, like most gay couple, like you're watching on TV. And I mean, you like go through the whole range because you have senators that like don't, that are voting against it. And then you hear people that are for it and give moving speeches and all of a sudden it like passes. Eyes 33, nays 29. <laughs> I have to say, it was um, just one of the most magical moments uh, that I've ever had. I don't think people appreciate what it means to be granted that right. Didn't need it, like, to validate who I am, but to be a part of a bigger, you know, nationwide experience, a country, you know, like, you're all of a sudden in the fold. My entire family, Mitch and I, are sitting in the apartment watching all of this on TV. We're sitting right here on the couch, like watching the whole thing happen. And I turned to Mick and I was like, we can't tell them this weekend. If we tell them now, it's going to sound so contrived and silly. And we don't want them to think, even if it's just temporary or in the back of their mind, that this was like a rushed decision, that it just happened like in the moment or happened this, you know. Even if we could tell them, explain to them that it was over the course of weeks and months, this like really uh, detailed conversation and, and really explicit conversation about ins and outs of marriage and what it means to each other, us, if we tell them now, we can't control what they might think that, you know, associating with the vote. So we waited. We had agreed that there was no proposal. Why, you know, it's not like a proposal necessary because we had agreed. It was a mutual agreement. So there's no need, I mean, we've talked about getting engagement rings, like 
No, you know, Paul said, I mean, I asked, and Paul said, no, we don't. We went to Israel for three weeks last summer, and Paul and I were having a conversation, and he said to me, you know, Mitch and I decided we're gonna get married. She's just like, you, so wait, did you propose? And she wanted to know the full story. I was like, no, neither of us proposed. We just like agreed on this. It was gonna happen at some point in the future. And she's like, no, you have to get a ring. Like you have to make, you have to do a grand gesture. If you don't, it's not worth anything. Like agreeing to get married is the most unromantic thing I've ever heard. And as we're working our way through Israel, there are tons and tons of artisans and jewelry shops and we're going into all of them. She's like, look at this one, look at this one, look at this one. I had no idea what Paul wanted. I mean, Paul has expensive taste, we all know that. But at the same time, we were in Israel and I didn't know if he was looking for more of like an artistic cultural piece. So we looked at the whole range of things and couldn't find anything. It's getting near the end of the trip and she's like, you need to like make a big deal out of this. You need to like figure this out. You need to come home with something to show it. And our last week we were in Jerusalem and it was probably our second or third last night. We see this H. Stern, the jewelry store. And she's like, let's just go into H. Stern. Let's just go look. And I walked in there and I literally like did a U-turn. I was like, it's all women's rings. I'm out of here. I'm dead. I don't want to look at this. Like I was not in the mood for it at this point. And I was like, no, we're going to ask. And so the lady comes over and I'm like, we want to look at men's rings. So this woman brings out this like, palette of rings and I'm like looking at it and immediately I spot this ring and it's right there and I was like that's the perfect ring to give to him. It's this white gold ring that kind of overlaps on itself and it looks like a hug. There's lots of like etched lines in it and it kind of represented for me like the craziness in our relationship and how different we are and how the same we are and the hug of the ring kind of is us despite all of that coming together. And I'm sitting on the plane on the way back and I have this little box and it's sitting on the tray table in front of me and the entire way I'm going back going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, and I'm freaking out about this. The night he comes back, which happened to be my birthday, late at night, I went to bed, he was jet lagged, he was awake. And he wakes up and it's like three in the morning. And I was like, no, 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 go back to bed. And I was like, I'll come in there and lay down with you. And I proposed to him right there in bed. And at first, he was still half asleep and I felt bad. I was like, yes, because uh, we already agreed. And I was like, why did you do this? Because we agreed not to, and now I feel bad. I couldn't find words to like explain my emotions, which were one part like el elation and happiness, and, but another part were like really nervous. Mitch moved to Boston for 10 months. The wedding gave us a dialogue to distract us with. Once the wedding kind of took up steam, I didn't have the time to like consider like how I felt about him being away because there was just an endless list that still has not gone away of things that we had to keep track of. This was how are we gonna work the weekends and when are we gonna see each other and what are we doing now and where are we going and they were constantly, which will be for the next couple of years too, that they'll have that and I think they're learning through it that you have to negotiate through life. He made a folder on the, in the computer and t titled it Sweet Jesus because it was like, I, in the beginning it was like, wow, like, Sweet Jesus, we're really doing this. Wedding planning is not easy for anybody. It's not easy when you're dealing with two families that are very different from each other. It's not easy when it's a gay wedding versus a straight wedding because there's a lot of obstacles in that that I never assumed. A lot of the forms we've gotten say bride. Once again, you're like, I have to point out to you that, and I, and I responded like, thanks for sending this, but I hope you realize you're DJing a gay wedding. I don't take it personally, but Mitch takes it all very, very personally. And he has emailed everyone back with kind of a terse response being like, please take the time to have some foresight and realize that you're dealing with two grooms here. But it begins to wear on you. Like, it began to wear on me. You can't blame them. On the other hand, I think that it's going to, even though marriage passed, it's going to take some time for fam, you know, that's the thing. It's not just families that didn't grow up accepting gay or like knowing, you know, being around it. It's even vendors. That means that... That's way too high. Yeah. No, yeah, that's yeah. way too high. Yeah. No, no. no. So, so I... you would want this to be like that, right? So then the middle section will be flush with the ring. We looked for wedding bands for a really long time and finally our friend Nancy, who's a jewelry designer, offered to do them and make them exactly however we wanted them. 
two years ago I actually was taking classes in jewelry design so it was sort of a perfect thing that came up and uh, I was actually very honored to be asked to design the rings. I think the ring for the wedding is very symbolic um, and it will always be. So these are the finished rings and these are the white brass versions and they were engraved. They both in, um, went with the initials intertwined where every other letter was their name or their, from their name. So um, it was very much the same as their invitation. And in this case for Mitch's ring, Love You Cakes was added. Once I uh, made these and tested them out on Paul and Mitch and they fit, then I went ahead and did them in 18 karat gold, which they have already. Design of the engagement ring definitely has meaning, uh, sort of special meaning. And then the wedding rings are what each of us individually wanted. The rings for us, I think, sort of just signify that that commitment is there. They knew they wanted to get married in New York now, you know, once the law was passed. And so, and Buffalo was the most economical place for all parties involved. We both realized very quickly that if we were going to do it in Buffalo, it's not like there's a beautiful beach to do down there. If it's going to be in Buffalo, it will not be a small wedding because my parents will want to invite every last person that they know. And then our wedding coordinator, she's like, have you looked at the Virtual Penny Art Gallery? And I was like, uh, I don't know. We looked at it online. It didn't really look like a place we want to be. And it looked too sterile and white. She's like, we're going there. And we walked in, and it was just like this amazing, funky, cool venue that nobody else had like, done anything at. I'd never seen an art gallery wedding before. It was amazing. It's easier for us as far as helping them because we're able to do things hands-on. We're here, we can get in our car and go down and see the different venues and take care of things. Fanny Markle has done everybody's bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah wedding that we can ever remember, and she also does all the flowers for my dad's company all the time. I went to two other florists in Buffalo, and my dad was like, you need to go visit Ms. Merkel. Well, I think every wedding is so different, and everyone has such different tastes. To try to bring that into a proper perspective with the wedding is very important. She has her own idea. She like asked you your wedding colors, and at first we couldn't give them to her, and she's like, listen, boys, you got to get it together. We're doing some wonderful presentations as guests walk in and then up on the second floor. Flowers are important because I think flowers through the years and the centuries have been a romantic thing. Flowers aren't feminine or girly or masculine. They're, they're just a lovely, lovely addition. It's like a painting. It could be a nude and it would be very acceptable in anyone's room, except if it was a picture of me, that wouldn't be too acceptable. She at least brought a breath of fresh air to the entire thing because when we were getting really stressed out, she was like, stop being silly. If she could like come and do my entire life, that'd be amazing because she has it together. And they have a wonderful caterer, Oliver's caterer. I work with uh, Paul and Mitch to determine what we're going to do for the table setup. And of course, Fanny. <laughs> I can't interfere with what Fanny's doing. We send out initially a menu that has thousands of items on it. And the initial uh, choices from there are pretty much what Paul and Mitch liked and I threw some of my input into the proposal and then we had several meetings after that. The menu came from a combination of the two of them compromising with each other and including their family's taste and then the ultimate tasting which they just took into consideration everything. Oh shit, this makes me nervous. I mean, I was most nervous about telling my dad. You know, I think that everyone was happy in the sense that I'm getting married, so marriage is like wedding. But everything else, I don't think really set in. My family is 
obnoxiously involved. Thank God they are, because I would never have been able to do this without them. As compared to Mitch's family, which I understand that they're down south, as opposed to my family actually living in Buffalo, they've just been completely absent from the entire process, even up to the point of we had to like inherently beg them to make their plane tickets and hotel reservations. We're like the responsible parent party without anybody giving assistance at all in any of the planning or anything. I think that's what I think both of us feel the ramifications of it. I'm nervous about my family. I don't know if that's a valid concern, but I, I mean I am. It's totally new to them. They're not either knowing of or supportive of us, so a lot of that has been very difficult for him to like reconcile at the same time as like having to meet a printing deadline. And that hurts, and I know it hurts him, and it hurts us, and it hurts Paul. You know, they're excited about the idea, that, about the event happening, but even the parts of the wedding are gonna be different, and they know that. And so it's, for them, it's like something that's really new. The wedding planning in itself has been pretty seamless. It's just been when differences in our families and our backgrounds have crept up and became a focal point. And it's in those instances you don't expect. Like we were drafting our program. He got really upset and rightfully so. And I got upset because I was like, we need to meet this deadline. Like we need to send this in now. We can't play around with this anymore. But at the same time, I had to be like, shut up, Paul. Like he's having a moment right now and you need to be understanding of it. It still takes time, you know, it's like an ongoing process when people come from that kind of environment. It just is. You want to believe that it stops it coming out, but it doesn't. There are family dynamics behind this that you have to contend with all the way through. Having to, like, stand up for yourself and your relationship and justify it, all the things you're doing and the symbolism that you are attaching to the actions that will occur during the wedding is like a really formative experience. I just have to remember that like it's this is about me and Paul, no one else, you know. I mean it's great that everyone's there to experience it with us, but this is our thing. A part of me and I know a part of Mitch still wishes that we had quietly eloped somewhere and gone to a beach and had it with ten people and that was it. Thank God I love him dearly because I never want to go through another wedding process again. To run an event period, like having done with Pride Agenda and all that stuff, it's a production. Jesus Christ, when it's your own wedding though, it's like you have a big personal stake in it and you don't want anything messed up. We do feel some pressure because out of our gay friends, we're the first to like take the plunge. You want to like, rep I, don't know, I don't know what I want to represent, but I want to represent something. No, we gotta go. We started envisioning like this very dapper 20 style wedding with like everybody in tuxes and women with fascinators. It really swept us away, this idea of having this very beautiful, formal, but like out there wedding. It's been amazing having a gay man like be able to officiate and walk you through the process. Ken and Mark was kind of that example to me that even if your life doesn't start out the way you it's kind of grown into, you can make it whatever you want and you can become the type of person that you want to be or that you're most comfortable with at any point in your life. Whenever Mark is asked to do a wedding from somebody he's known from his past. He is moved beyond belief. First of all, we have conversations um, initially about what are you looking for, what are you hoping for, who we are. And then we have some pretty intimate conversations about who they are and what they care about and how they feel about each other. He's appreciative of the 
all the basic reasons why you get married and all the like bigger philosophical reasons. Even though I am convinced and I make sure that everybody I, I have the opportunity to do this with understands that the ceremony is of prime importance and they need to be focused on that. I know that the time leading up to that is going to be filled with details about flowers and food and craziness and who's coming to, the, to what and so I like to take that out, have them send me all the stuff there is, print it out, have it with me and they don't have to remember it. If it was any other officiant, Mitch for sure and I as well would want to know every word that's going to come out of their mouth beforehand and approve everything that happens because I don't want some surprise and some random comment to be made. With Mark, we almost know nothing of what he is going to say at the ceremony. I am so excited to hear what he has to say. The most fun part of the wedding process is actually the ceremony. marriage ceremonies because life has changed are becoming more about people and less about prescription. I think the one thing that I almost always insist is writing their own vows. You need to say what it is you're thinking and what you're pledging. I can't say enough how excited I am to have Paul a part of our family. Like, we all absolutely fell in love with him. This is a wedding about all of us. This is about a time for us to recommit to the people we care about, but it's also a time for us to understand that they need us for the rest of their lives now. Everybody who's been invited has a part in this marriage or they wouldn't be there family, and friends. I welcome you to this evening of celebration. Paul and Mitch have invited us here to this place to share in their declaration of a lifelong commitment to each other. Your blessings, support, and encouragement are important to this union, not only now, but in the days and years to come. Amidst the turmoil of our world, with all of life's struggles and concerns, it is with deep joy and a sense of wonder and awe that we pause to affirm the power of love. This ceremony calls us all to renew our vows of love and commitment to one another. Marriage is a commitment to life, to the best that two people can find and bring out in each other. Paul Evan Ninos, I choose you. <laughs> I could say it more dramatically in the manner I last said it to you, but doing so in front of all these people would be a little embarrassing. So let's keep that between us. So instead, I will say this. You always joke about being one step ahead of me, and I always give you a hard time because you do regularly walk two steps ahead of me. <laughs> but the truth is, with you one step ahead of me these past three and a half years, have been the happiest, most successful, most fulfilling years in my entire life. And in three and a half short years, you have become, without a shadow of a doubt, my better half. Spending the rest of my life learning from you and experiencing the good and the bad in this world with you far surpasses even my wildest dreams. And here's why. You're very handsome. <laughs> You're the most loyal, supportive, kind, and generous person I know. And foremost, I see in you a reflection of the person I want to be. So this is my promise to you on this day. I'll do my best to see the world through your eyes. I will do my best to support your aspirations and your dreams. I will do my best to comfort you in times of distress, fatigue, and illness. I will do my best to celebrate with you in times of celebration. And I promise to do all that I can to give you all you want in this world. This is my solemn vow. Mitch, the first time I left you at the airport to fly off to India, I felt a pang of immediate sadness. I knew you would only be gone for three weeks, but for the first time in my life, I was afraid those three weeks would literally return into an eternity. Our relationship and lives have grown and changed, taking us from India to Israel, 
from Boston to Buffalo, from Oklahoma to Fort Smith, Cape Cod to New York. Home is seemingly some momentary stop along the way. But it's home, the feeling of love and security, trust and faith, familiarity and endless adventure that I found with you. No one has ever inspired and grounded me, pushed and challenged me, and most importantly, accepted and loved me with such selfless devotion as you have. I cannot imagine today or any other day without your voice on the other end of the line, your sleepy head mumbling I love you as I run out the door early in the morning, or your relentless pursuit to actually get me to fall asleep in bed. <laughs> I promise to continue on our crazy adventure with you, always excited for the next step in our journey. I promise to always support you through life's ups, but more importantly, through life's downs, however they may come. But most importantly, I promise to love you with the same selfish devotion as you have loved me with. I love you, Cakes. The public nature of uh, getting married and the public ability to do it is an opportunity to say out loud something that should you decide you have a big fight one day, you're not gonna pick up and put your suitcase in and walk out because everybody has a piece of this. So whether you're at the beach where it feels 100% relaxing, natural and right, or navigating your life adventures, be they travel or stepping outside your comfort zone, remember that you told me that your relationship is the kind that has a core that lasts. And now that the two of you have spoken the words and performed the rite that unites your life, I do hereby, by the power vested in me, and only within the last year, declare your marriage to be valid and binding, and proclaim you to be husbands according to the state of New York, and in the sight of God and humankind. And on behalf of all of you here, I ask God's blessing on you. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God always grant you greatest gift of all, the gift of peace and the gift of love. Together we say amen. 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 The institution of marriage is made stronger by same-sex couples being afforded the right to marry. Because I think we appreciate marriage more than straight couples do, in part because uh, you never appreciate what you have. There's no fairy tale aspect to it. It's not that at all. Which is great because you cut through all the nonsense I think that people ascribe to, to marriage. It's kind of neat now, thinking that like, through my actions, I get to like, redefine this. I get to, you know, put in my part. And then for people that come, that go back to straight weddings, they now have a gay wedding reference point. It might even contribute to them seeing straight wedding marriages and straight weddings in a different light. It's such a blessing to me just seeing my family all there and supporting him. And because like I said, I never in a million years thought that because I was afraid, you know, like when Mitch told me I was afraid for Mitch. 
he has like helped our family evolve so much. And just one family doing that will help other people evolve. He has taught me a lot, and that's something that I will forever be grateful for. Being here for Mitchell's wedding is probably a bigger deal than being for either of my brother's weddings. I mean, this, I know, has been something he has wanted for so long, and to finally sort of be in a place in his life where he's happy, he's found love, and he lives somewhere where you can legally get married, I mean, that's a huge deal. To me, marriage is making this commitment with someone and deciding, like, I believe my life is better because you're in it. Together, you're, you're able to take on whatever goals you have in life. If you would ask me when Mitch and I got together if I knew that he was going to be traveling the world for a living and that we'd have to move abroad in a year, and had I ever thought that I would drop all of my life, I would have said no originally, and now I'm so excited for it. And I get to see the world and do things that I never thought I could do in my life. I think I've gone into this with a lot more realistic view of how people are and how relationships go and how just because you're married does not mean you're going to always agree with or accept everything your, your other does. Oddly, people say you lose sort of, you lose freedom when you get married or like you're giving it up, but I think you like gain a lot. And I'm most looking forward to just like exploring that and seeing where it goes. Folks keep saying, you know, it's been nearly a year, the, the sky hasn't fallen. And what we've seen here in New York and what we'll see across the country is, you know, just more love, more people who, you know, truly want to be able to, you know, pledge their, their life and love and commitment to somebody. When they're going through this right now, it's funny how society is all of a sudden becoming more accepting. I mean, you have it from the Oval Office right now, which is interesting, uh, in trying to put a national push in for something like this. These are great things, so I think they're living in an exciting time, and I think it's a more accepting time for them. However, nationally, our marriages aren't recognized. Uh, the Defense of Marriage Act still exists, and you know, we're very excited that President Obama uh, did express his support for marriage equality and has also stated that he and his administration have no intention of defending the Defense of Marriage Act. It's entirely possible that the President of the United States actually believes that gay and lesbian couples deserve the right to marry, and it's absolutely possible that the President, the more he learned, the more he evolved and became good on our issues and a supporter of our issues. And why should the president be any different than members of our own family? You know, be at one point and evolve to another place. I don't think we should hold the president to a, to a higher standard. I think it goes without saying that it was, it was partly from his heart and it was partly political. And I, I certainly admire and respect the fact that he believes in it, but the reality is that he's running for re-election. It's the first election since the passage of marriage, and we need to make sure that we stand by those who stood by us and, you know, took, you know, what for some was an incredibly courageous vote. Make sure that nobody who voted for marriage loses their seat because of that vote. I think it's ignorance and fear. And, and people who don't understand, who don't get it, who don't know, Paul. At this point in our lives and in this country, you can't discriminate against anyone and you just have to live a life that's filled with love and compassion and just love everyone. I think marriage is still a great institution. I think it's great for to have a family and be married and have that security and, of a marriage. You know, you're conditioned to people's actions and inactions to like believe and internalize that like you're not supposed to be doing this. Even though you've moved on and you're taking these amazing steps for yourself and I think for other people too. I mean, I do feel like it's like we're part of the first sort of round of 
young people getting married. But the voice stays with you, I think. I, it may never go away. My hope for same-sex couples is now that we have marriage, that we don't take it for granted. First of all, don't get married unless you're friends. If you're not friends, it isn't going to work. Don't go to bed angry. Don't wake up angry. Sometimes it's hard, but just <coughs> kick them in the shins while you're in bed, and then it's all over with. To celebrate as many moments as you can, as often as you can, because life is so short and difficult and hard that um, you never miss the opportunity to um, celebrate the little joys and victories of the day, of the year, of the week. Be good people, be decent folks, treat yourselves well, treat your spouses well. And realize the other person isn't perfect. And they're not always going to agree, and that's their option. See, I don't believe in happiness, I believe in contentment. And I think, see, happiness eludes you. Contentment is there for a long, long time. And learn to speak to one another. Don't turn your backs on one another. For their future, I just wish them the most happiness and for them to know that we are there for them through thick and thin and that we love them and are just so happy for them. I used to say that the comment was that marriage is a 50-50 proposition. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. I believe marriage is 100%. If you give of yourself all the time and you're willing to compromise and understand and just accept the fact that nothing ever goes in a straight line for any great length of time, uh, they should have a wonderful life together. There's something magical about going through that. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. I don't, I, I don't know if it's just like shaping and a, you know, a great human experience that shapes who you are, but there's something there like about exercising that option like yes I'm gonna do like I know I, I don't have to but I'm going to you know <laughs>